Welcome to Iceland. This North Atlantic island near the Arctic Circle is made of active volcanoes, powerful geysers, black sand beaches, and enormous glaciers. At 40,000 square miles, Iceland is about the size of Portugal or the state of Virginia, but nearly 80% of its landmass is uninhabitable. It is the smallest population of any country in Europe. Before World War I, Iceland was under Danish rule, thus using the Danish krone as its currency. When the Danish-Iceland Act of Union was ratified in 1918, which made Iceland a sovereign nation, they created their own currency, called the Icelandic krona. Krona meaning crown in Icelandic. By 1981, the krona had started to experience so much inflation that the Icelandic government decided the best way to rescue it was to simply redefine its value. The value of the Icelandic krona would be one hundredth of its former value. Iceland had a simple economy that took advantage of its geographic location. Fishing was Iceland's biggest industry, and most of their income is generated through fish exports. Fishing is still so essential to Iceland's financial success that the krona is adorned with pictures of fish. Iceland's location is also conducive to the production of both hydroelectric and geothermal energy, promoting power-intensive industries such as the production of aluminum. Iceland had a modest economy and a population of a little over 300,000, which is nearly the same as the city of St. Paul. The government owned most of the banks. Lending was done domestically, supporting the citizens of Iceland, and imports, exports, and the financial industry were all heavily regulated. In 1994, Iceland joined the European Economic Area, allowing them to engage in free trade with Europe. In addition, it became easier for people and capital to travel in and out of Iceland. Still being separate from the European Union, Iceland received almost all of the benefits of European Union membership, but they still had their own currency. Icelandic banks were now able to exchange currency with other European countries, giving them access to an entirely new, more powerful marketplace. For a while, nothing changed. Banks were government-owned, which made them relatively conservative in their financial strategy and lending. In the late 1990s, everything changed. The banks were privatized and deregulated. Three large banks emerged, Glitner, Lonsbanki, and Kaupthing. Bored with the conservative financial measures taken by the Icelandic government, these newly privatized banks adopted much riskier, more aggressive tactics, knowing they could make much more money under these new conditions. Iceland had always had a relatively high rate of inflation. To combat this, the government increased interest rates. To understand the effects of this, let's take a look at a money market diagram. Higher interest rates cause an increase in the demand for the krona because lenders and investors can make more from lending and investing. These higher interest rates attracted international interest as well. As the demand increased, the krona's value appreciated. The three Icelandic banks, Glitner, Landsbanki, and Kaupthing, started making lucrative deals in Europe and all around the world. They used the earnings from these deals to finance other deals. And soon enough, the economy was propped up almost entirely on foreign currency. The banks, their assets, and even the krona were being overvalued. All of this caused a multi-billion dollar bubble, or, in simpler terms, wealth that never existed. At home, the economy appeared to be booming, and these bankers were the heroes that made it possible. Similar to the United States, the Icelandic government deregulated the mortgage market. A bank could now give a loan for up to 90% of the property value, and they were competing against one another for customers. People who previously couldn't afford homes now could. This drove up demand in the housing market, which in turn drove up prices. For example, the economy is now up. A bank gives Bjorn a $200,000 loan for a house. Suddenly, our friend Bjorn defaults on his loan and can't pay. The house goes into foreclosure and the bank seizes it. But if the economy is now struggling and demand for homes has gone back down, the house is back to its true value of $100,000. The bank can now only get half of what they're expecting, making them less able to pay off their debts. On top of this housing bubble, banks were buying and selling their own stocks and even offering loans to ordinary people so that they could purchase said stock. This created increased demand in the stock market, pushing the entire economy into one huge bubble. By 2006, people were starting to realize the instability of the economy in Iceland and the horror that could follow. And here's where the problem went from bad to worse. Whenever there is mass panic in an economy, people do what economists call a bank run. Meaning that to protect themselves, everyone withdraws all their money from the banks. The problem, of course, is that no bank has enough money in cash to pay its customers back with. On top of that, the Icelandic banks had a liquidity problem, meaning most of its assets were in the form of things like houses. Essentially, people were realizing that the boom in the economy wasn't supported by enough real wealth. As a quick cash grab, 
two of the largest banks opened online savings account options throughout Europe. These banks collected millions of pounds and euros in savings accounts. Instead of paying off their debts, they reinvested it, racking up more debt obligations. Then they based their financial records and investments on the assumption of this money, despite the fact that Brits could wake up any day and decide they wanted it back. Over the summer of 2008, this very thing happened. Billions of foreign investments were withdrawn. The bank's payments on these debts were becoming due and the banks didn't have the liquid funds to pay them. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers, a huge bank in the United States, went bankrupt. Confidence in the financial sector disappeared overnight and banks stopped lending to one another in order to cover their debts. It was far too late for the Icelandic banks, however. For years, they had borrowed from other European banks and their liabilities were now nearly 10 times the GDP of the entire country of Iceland. Because of the magnitude of the bank's debt, it was impossible for the government to bail out the banks. The money simply didn't exist, so the government allowed the banks to go bankrupt. The nation's economy deteriorated. Remember when Iceland joined the European Economic Area, but not the European Union? Meaning that instead of switching to the year, they retained the krona? Well, the krona has a floating exchange rate, meaning it fluctuates with market demand. The krona fell 50% in one week, and the stock market fell by 95%. For a decade, the krona had been appreciating, increasing 900% in a 14-year span. At its peak, many Icelanders used the high exchange rates to take out bank loans in foreign currency. But when the krona lost half its value, mortgages doubled. The loans still had to be repaid in the foreign currency but it now costs twice as much to exchange. The government started by reclaiming control of the banks. They received a $2.1 billion bailout from the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. This was used to protect domestic savings, preventing the entire Icelandic economy from deteriorating irreversibly. Foreign withdrawals were frozen and the Icelandic citizens were banned from buying foreign stock or currency. As a result, all of the wealth was reinvested into Icelandic businesses. Although many Icelanders continue to face deep debt, the government forgave the excess debt created by currency depreciation. The low exchange rates have spiked demand in Icelandic exports because other currencies became more powerful in Iceland. This also sparked a sharp increase in tourism. And the country has taken advantage of this by expanding its tourism industry. Unlike the United States, the government went to real lengths to investigate the financial crisis. The government formed a committee that indicted 29 bankers. Sure, it's a small number, but it was 29 times the amount of arrests that occurred as a result of the United States financial crisis. The problem? Foreign investors never got their money back. And GDP has only just returned to pre-crisis levels. 